Why don't we do this? I need prayer. You need prayer. We need prayer. Let's go before the Lord and let's just uh, enter into his word, his presence, his spirit today. So Father, we come before you. We thank you for the presence of God in this place. Lord, we thank you that we can come to church. Lord, and even though it might be stuffy in the room, Lord, we thank you that we can come to church and it is not a stuffy place to be because we come to celebrate and to exalt Jesus above all other things. And Lord, there is nothing stuffy to do with lifting up and glorifying the name of Jesus Christ. And so Father, we thank you that we get to come into this place and to hear from your Holy Spirit today, Lord. We acknowledge that it's Jesus Christ that's the leader of this house. So Father, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you would open our eyes to see our ears, to hear our hearts and our minds, to understand your word, Lord, that as we experience your word, your presence, your will, your desire for our lives, we would take what we have today and we would walk out of this building equipped with your presence and with your power on the inside of us to be who and what you've called us to be as your church. And Lord, we give you the praise and the glory. Father, we thank you for all the churches across the Inland Empire that are working together to build your kingdom, to teach and preach and glorify the name of Jesus, to tell the world uh, that is lost and dying, that there is a God who loves them. Father, we thank you that you would bless them today as you bless us. And Lord, we thank you that we are all working together, body, members of the body of Christ, building your kingdom for your glory. And we give you the praise and the honor and the glory. In Jesus' mighty name, we all together said, Amen. Amen. Well, if you've got your Bibles, go with me to Mark in the third chapter, Mark in the third chapter, and we're going to actually look at Hebrews in the 11th chapter, but we've been in Hebrews the 11th chapter for three weeks, if you're uh, in this verse for three weeks, if you're just joining us, we're being, we've been going line upon line, precept upon precept, and we're in a unique series of the honorable mentions of faith. Now, we've kind of moved past the section of the hall of faith in which each person, their act of faith is described in detail, and now these are the honorable mentions of faith, and oftentimes what we see in what we're looking at is people who live less than perfect lives, yet God used them in their humility to do something great for their people, their time, and for his kingdom. And today, as we continue to look at humble faith, part number three, we're going to look at Hebrews 11, chapter verse number 32. The author of Hebrews is giving these honorable mentions, and he says these words. He says, time would fail me to continue to talk about it. There's this rhythmic motion of what he's doing as he's writing. As he's kind of stacking on top of what he's already laid even more examples to say that there is more, there is more to discuss than time even gives us. So today, we're just going to focus on honorable mentions in the on the hall of faith and humility. Time would fail me to mention or talk about Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah and David and Samuel and the prophets and these are honorable mentions in the hall of faith. Uh, I think it's funny, last week Pastor Dan mentioned about it, but I, I've, I've had actually a few emails in, in the course of the past couple of years of Pastor Luke, did, did you know that President Obama is in the Bible? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And they're like, you know, some of the people are like, Pastor Luke, he's in, he's in the book of Daniel, he's in the book of Isaiah, and there's some prophets. And I'm like, now, come on, now that's, that's, a little bit, that's a little bit too far. But they're like, no, his name's in the Bible. And I'm like, oh, oh, you're talking about Barack. All right, that, it's not a Barack Obama, that's, that's a different Barack. They might have the same for his name, but praise God. Uh, so we learned about Barack last week and how God used him and, and, and the credit and the, and the idea of humility. And today we're going to look at an amazing story of a man by the name of Samson. Now the interesting thing about Samson is when you look at Samson's life, more often than not, when we look about the story of Samson, uh, we study what not to do more than we do what to do. Why? Because Samson is the story of a man who had incredible gift and strength from God, but yet had incredible weaknesses with his own life and self-control and morality, and he could not gather himself together to be in control of his own life. And ultimately, Samson is the story of a life of compromise and the consequences thereof. But what Hebrews is focusing on is not what people did not do. Hebrews, in the 11th chapter, is the hall of faith. It's focusing on what people did do. And so today we're going to look at the success of what Samson did do and why the Holy Spirit's inspiration puts Samson into the hall of faith as an honorable mention in humility. So when we look at Samson, the story of Samson, and if you're not familiar with, with who Samson is, uh, I'll, I'll give you the, the nickel uh, version of Samson. And if you want the whole version, you can go and read, and we'll look at some verses today, but you can read in Judges, the 13th, 14th, 15th, and 16th chapter about Samson in the story. But Samson is the strongest man who ever lived. Now, in Greek mythology, you have Hercules, but he is a mythological figure. Samson is a man who was blessed from birth, called 
called out by birth from God as a Nazarite. A Nazarite was a, a person who held a commitment to God, a threefold commitment. One was to not cut their hair. The second was to not drink alcoholic drinks. The third was to not have anything to do or touch anything that had to do with anything that was unclean, to keep themselves clean before God. And God had a plan for Samson's life. So God gave Samson a unique gift, the gift of strength. Samson was the strongest man to ever live on the earth. As a matter of fact, we'll see some of Samson's stories, but there are some amazing stories of what Samson did, including ripping out the gates of a city and carrying these massive, hundred, multiple hundreds of pounds of wood and iron, uh, carrying them off to the top of the hill and to make an example, and, and the feats that Samson did. And so Samson was this man who grew up, and, he, and God used him to begin to bring deliverance to Israel. He was the strongest man who ever lived on earth, and God used this gift, but Samson, through the course of his life, gave into uh, various temptations and various moral failures. We know more famously the end of Samson's life when he got connected with a, a, a woman who was pleasing to his eye by the name of Delilah. Delilah was bribed by Samson's uh, enemies, the Philistines, for 1,100 pieces of silver to find the secret of Samson's strength because they recognized that it was a supernatural ability that Samson had. And so over the course of Samson's life, Delilah would try to tempt him and coerce him. And Samson, you love me. Tell me what it was. And Samson would talk about, well, you need new ropes to, to, to make me. If you give me new ropes, I, I, can't, I can't break the new ropes. And, and he would, she would tie him up. And, you know, you'd think, he'd get the, you'd think he'd get the hint like he'd wake up with new ropes on him and be like, what? What's going on? Why is there ropes on me? You know, and she'd come again. And finally, after the course of his life, she pestered him enough to where he finally gave into the secret that God said, don't cut my hair. And the, sink, the secret of strength is God's anointing on my life is the fact that my hair has not been touched and so she shaves his head when he goes to bed I mean that must have really he must have really been out right I mean so he wakes up finds himself with his hair cut and his strength has left him and so we find at the end of Samson's life that the Philistines they take and they pluck out his eyes and they use him as a spectacle and they put him into the work of the prisons and he's grinding the mills and at the end of Samson's life, he's there. They bring him out into a temple of 3,000 people, and they're, they're rejoicing to their gods and to their, to their glory that they have Israel's savior of the time as this spectacle, and his eyes have been plucked out. And Samson cries out to God as his hair begins to grow again, and he says, God, if there's one last thing you can do, let me, let me bring these people down. And so they put him between the two pillars of their temple, and Samson holds on to these pillars, and with his strength, the Spirit of the Lord comes upon him, and he pushes these pillars apart. And the temple comes crashing down on Samson and on everybody around there. And the Bible says that 3,000 Philistines were killed in that time. And he, Samson did more at the end of his life than he did all throughout his life for uh, the deliverance of Israel. But Samson ultimately is a story of strength. So why is Hebrews talking about this guy who had a lot of moral issues? And today I thought uh, uh, what we do is focus on the, the issue or, or the, 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 the good part of what Samson's life is. And that is Samson is synonymous with strength. Whenever we talk about Samson, we talk about the strong man, the strength of faith. And you see, God wants us to live a life of strength and faith in him. And so as we look at the story of faith and as we look at what faith does for us and the strength that we live in in faith, I, I, I want to take, take you back for a moment. And I want to take you back. I was tripping out on this uh, yesterday. I was telling the church, 25 years ago, to, to uh, my initiation into the schoolyard boyhood. Okay, it's fifth grade. I was the king of the tetherball courts. I was white little yuppie boy. Everybody was like, you probably were playing Pokemon. Praise Jesus. There was no Pokemon in my day. That was a little bit later, but we were the tetherball kings. And there was a boy in my class. His name was John. And John was the rival tetherball king. It's fifth grade in elementary. And John said some things about my family. And so I said, all right, John, you want to talk like that? Let's go. You ready? So he's like, you know, all right, let's do this. And so, you know, like any schoolyard fight in, in initiation for the boy, any schoolyard fight, what do you do? You go to the corner of the field, all of the kids gather around in the circle, and they're like, fight, 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 right? And so like, you know, I've got my, me and my geek friends, all, you know, all scrawny little white kids. They're like rubbing on my shoulders like, you got this, you got this. And then there's John and his guys and his group of miscreants on the other end. And, and, and John, let me just, let me just specify something about, about this guy, John. John was that guy in elementary school that you wonder, why are you in elementary school? Like, 
I'm fairly certain John already had a goatee in fifth grade, and I think he might have even drove himself to school. And, and let me give you a little bit of history of my, of my fighting history but in this time. My, my parents, my dad particularly, had a, a very interesting way of, of raising children. My sister, Pastor Jess on the front row and I, we would, we would often bicker and we would often fight. And we had this living room in our house. And, and so we would, all, we would run back and forth and scream at each other. And dad would get up, and, you know, back in the day when you had to, like, actually turn the TV knob. He'd get up and, like, click the TV off. And he'd say, all right, what's your problem? What's your problem? Well, she said there, he did this and he pestered me. And you say, all right, turn the TV off. Have at it. <laughs> kind of like, like the UFC guy, you know, like, you ready? You ready? Let's get it on. Like, so that's what my dad would do. So he'd just say, have at it. And so my sister and I, we would just go at it, right? And so I had learned how to fight from my sister. Now, now <laughs> I appreciate, you know, I appreciate the, the move of feminism and, and equality within the workplace and, you know, girls and women intellectually need to be treated the same as a man. But ladies, I'm sorry if it offends you, but there is a physical difference between a man and how a woman fights. Now, Ronda Rousey might be a different category in general, but for the most part, men fight a little bit different than women. And I found this out in fifth grade on the schoolyard, you can see, because how my sister and I would fight is, is, is we would close our eyes and just kind of like swing. And you know, instead of like a punch, it was this kind of like, right? So you just like close your eyes and just go at it, right? And whoever, it's like those robots. Remember the robots where you click the triggers and whichever one got knocked down? That's, that's how we did it. And so here I am in fifth grade at the schoolyard, and I'm ready, and all my friends are rubbing on me. It's like in the corner, and all of a sudden the bell rings, you know, the fight bell rings, and I go out there, and I'm like, I'm going to hit him hard. I'm going. So I, I rush John, and I go out there, my eyes closed, and I'm just like going to town. I feel it. And I mean, I am landing. I can feel it. I'm like, oh, that was good. That was good. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. And I'm thinking in my mind, like, John is just like dizzy and like, you know, like, and I'm thinking, this guy's never going to say anything else. And so all of a sudden, I'm like, oh, when did I get up? And I'm like, whew, I'm expecting to see John all like black-eyed and bruised. And John was just standing there. <laughs> Not even blocking it, just like taking it on the chest like. And no joke, you know, my dad says, true story. I mean, I'll remember this forever, forever, for the rest of my life. John looked at me and he said, okay, my turn. You ever seen those movies when it's like first person camera, right? And all of a sudden like the camera starts spinning and you can tell like the person got knocked out and like the camera goes blurry. Like, so that's like my first person. Like John says, my turn. And then all of a sudden everything hurt and then it went blurry. And I remember the sky started to like, like, I'm like, why am I looking at the sky? And then all of a sudden I woke up and there's nobody around me except the yard duty. Like what happened? And I'm like, I don't know. I thought I won. And that was my initiation into the, to, to, to manhood. That was my bar mitzvah, you know, into like, all right, dad, show me. And, you know, I got home and dad's like, let me show you how to do it now. You know, let me, let me show, teach you how to man fight. But uh, I think a lot of times in life, we as Christians are living out my schoolyard fight. You know, we come out thinking, you know what, oh man, I'm ready. The devil, he's going after my kids. The devil, he's going after my family. He's going after my happiness. He's going after my finances. He's going after my job. He's going after my, my, my neighborhood. He's going after my city. He's going after the things that I care about. So I am, and I'm ready. And we got, we got ourselves ready to go. And we get out there. And all of a sudden, we get it handed to us. Slapped around, beat up put down, put back into our place. Why? Because like my schoolyard fight, I think a lot of times what happens is we spend a lot of time fighting our brothers and sisters instead of out there fighting the fight that needs to be fought. You see, Paul says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in the pulling down of strongholds. You see, our fight, fight is not with the person on the other side uh, of the aisle. Our fight is not uh, uh, with the person with the uh, a different colored skin. Our, per our fight is not with the guy that's got a badge on. Our fight is not with the person that, 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 is, that is in the country uh, in less than legal. Our fight is not these things. But what happens is we think we're ready to show up and we get it handed to us. And you see, 
The devil truly and his cohorts are working overtime on the church to put them in their place, to put them in the category of everybody else that, you know what, you're just living this thing called religion. You, you just have yet another mindset that everybody else has in the world, and you need to get into your category and with everybody else and sit down and shut up, and you do your thing, I'll do my thing, and everybody else will do their thing, and nobody else is going to do anything. And he is working overtime on the church, beating the crud out of us so that we don't stand up to be who God has called us to be. Because can I tell you something? That is not God's purpose for his church, for you and I. You see, the purpose for the church is God's delivery system for his glory to this world. God sent Jesus Christ to reveal his glory. The revelation of glory came with Jesus Christ. But God brought the church into motion to carry his glory to the world. And if the devil can do anything, he can get the church to say, hey, you can't do that. You're not strong enough. I already beat you up one time. Why are you trying to get up and do it again? You're not worth it. You're not strong enough. You're not equipped enough. You just need to sit down, shut up, and be quiet like everybody else. And God says, that is not my plan for you. Amen. Now you have to forgive me preaching. I might preach a little bit today. Is that all right? That is not my plan for you. God has a purpose for you. You are the delivery system of God's glory to the world. We like to talk about change, man. I was, I, I was in the Philippines a month ago, and just like when Obama talked eight years ago about change, the word change in the Philippines ignites a fire. I mean, I'd be preaching, and, and I'm trying to relate to these kids, and I see that I, I, maybe they were getting hot, and they were kind of like some of y'all, like eyes starting to roll in the back of your head, so it's like, okay, I got to get them, wake up, right? So you could say one or two things. You could say Manny Pacquiao, and they'd be like, yeah! Or you could say change, and they'd be like, ah! because they're all about change. This world, we're all, we look at, look at the city. Look what happened just down the street from the church. Look what's going on. I mean, did anybody notice that, that with Munich, you know, there's this like cycle, like there's a terrorist attack. Everybody changed their Facebook profile. They put the flag on there and they, they say pray and then social media starts trending. And then like a couple of weeks later, the, it just kind of goes back to, you don't notice, anybody knows about Munich? It was just like, oh yeah, there's another one. This world needs change and God's purpose for us, his church, is the delivery system for the change that works in this world. It is the glory of God revealed to the people who are lost and dying and going to hell. But the devil is going to do everything he can to hold on to his territory, to be the strong man on earth when Adam and Eve lost it for everybody, all humanity. I, 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 we might need to jump Adam and Eve when we get to heaven, all right? Let's all just surround them. Say, y'all messed it up for everybody. They handed the dominion and the strength to the devil. And I had you turn to Mark in the third chapter. And Mark in the third chapter, the, the religious, of course, it's always the religious that, 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 that end up putting their foot in their mouth. The religious are looking at Jesus, and Jesus is doing all these wonders and miracles and these gifts and all these different things. And they're, they're looking at Jesus, and, and they say, this guy is out of his mind. And they say, he's from the devil. And, and Jesus, I mean, he's so smart. He's just inspirational from the, God, from the words of God. And God just gives him everything to say at the right moment. And Jesus says, look, how can Satan cast out Satan? And he says, you know, Abraham Lincoln quoted this. He says, a house divided against itself cannot stand. And then Jesus says, I like it what the New Living Translation says it like this. Jesus says, let me illustrate this a little bit further. Let me just, let me, let me take y'all on a journey with me. Jesus says, who is powerful enough to enter the house of a strong man like Satan and plunder his goods? And so here we have this idea. I mean, think about it. You, you remember when, when, when Arnold was, was the governor? You remember that? We called him the governator, right? And think about that. I mean, a strong man. Who, Jesus says, who is powerful enough to walk into somebody like Arnold's house 
and take all, you think, you think Arnold Schwarzenegger, like, no, I'm talking like Arnold Schwarzenegger, like, let's go Arnold Schwarzenegger, like, 1986, right, like, let's go that Arnold, all right, you think you're going to walk into Arnold Schwarzenegger's house, like, fresh, and, uh, fresh from Austria, like, found himself in, like, fame, and now he's got all this Hollywood money, you think you're going to walk into Arnold Schwarzenegger's house and be like, hey, I'm going to take all your stuff, right? What's he going to say to you? Well, you know what he's going to say. He's going to say, hasta la vista, baby. Right? That's what he's going to say. <laughs> Jesus says, who's going to go into a strong man's house and plunder his goods? And I love how the New Living Translation says it. Who's going to go into the strong man's house and pl a strong man like Satan? You see, he has strongholds. He has authority. He has dominion on earth. He was given to him by man. I mean, look at the strongholds on our city. The NPR says about the Inland Empire that it's a place where people go to lose hope and die. That's called a stronghold. Look at the strongholds in your family. You've seen generational curses, the sins of the father passed down to the son, and it's like, you think, man, I don't want my kids to live the mistakes that I have lived in my life. Strongholds. Strongholds with your friends. Strongholds in your life when it comes to addictions and sins and emotions and all these different things. Strongholds that uh, you don't understand what that person did to me. I'll never forget. I'll never let it go. That's called a stronghold. And he has strongholds on us. And Jesus says, who's going to go into that guy's house and break those strongholds? And I love what he says, unless he is stronger. You see... You can't go into Arnold's house unless you're stronger than Arnold. Why? Because Arnold's going to want to take some Greco-Roman wrestling techniques to you, and you have to be prepared to do so. And so Jesus says, you can't go into the strong man's house and plunder his goods unless you yourself are stronger. And what Jesus is saying, he's simply laying out a military tactic a very simple idea when it comes to the ideals of military, and it's this. That in order to take a stronghold, you have to be stronger than it. And so Jesus is saying, I'm not coming of Satan. Why? Because Satan's got strongholds. I'm coming of God. And guess who is stronger than Satan? Jesus said, I saw him fall like lightning. I was there when he got booted from heaven and I have come to bring the authority in heaven to earth to plunder hell to populate heaven and the only way strongholds are going to be broken is if somebody stronger breaks them but we walk our lives like my schoolyard fight well I'm strong and I can do this and then we go out to the fight and we get it handed to us and so what happens? We back down and we look and we say, why, why even fight? Why even stand up? Why even do anything else? That's, you know what? I'm going to let just the pastor do that. I'm, I'm going to let the, the TV preacher do that. You know, I, I'm, I'm not going to share. I'm just going to, I'm going to let somebody else do that because I got punked one time and I don't want to do it again. You see, a fight is so much easier to win when it's a forfeit. And that's what the devil's working on getting us as the church to do. And you see, we're talking about Samson and what Samson did. In humble faith, Samson is synonymous with strength. And in, Josh, in Judges, the 13th chapter, the angel of the Lord comes to Samson's mama. And he says, behold, you're going to conceive and have a child. I mean, it's like, it's, it's like the angel with Mary. It's like the same thing. He says, behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. And no razor shall come upon his head. The child shall be a Nazarite from the womb. And he shall begin to deliver out of the, uh, Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. You see, the very beginning of Samson's life, Samson had a calling on his life. He was born for a reason. You know what? The devil is working over high, overtime uh, on the church. He's working overtime on millennials and working overtime uh, on the young to say, guess what? You were born this way. We were all born a certain propensity to sin. It's called sin nature. But God says, you might have been born with the nature of sin, but you were called by the nature of grace to do something bigger than you could do by yourself. 
And like Samson was called out by God, you and I, the church of Jesus Christ, are called out by grace to do something in this world for God's kingdom, to plunder the strong man's house and to populate the kingdom of God with his treasures. But the devil's going to try to get you to not live called. I'm just trying to survive. Pastor Luke, you don't understand. Like, I'm just a mom. I've got kids at home. What can I do that's significant for the kingdom? Pastor Luke, you don't understand. I'm just a laborer. I'm the low man on the totem pole. I've got a mop or a broom or a lawnmower. Pastor Luke, you don't understand. I, I didn't even graduate high school. I'm not educated. I can't, I can't formulate sentences and logical thoughts. And when somebody starts dropping science as an argument to me, my face goes numb and I don't even know. Pastor Luke, you don't even understand. I'm at the sunset of my life. I've already lived my life. I'm tired. I'm waiting for Jesus to come back. Pastor Luke, you don't understand. I'm just a kid. I'm barely graduating high school. I'm flunking out of college. I don't know anything. You don't understand. And the devil's going to try to get to tell you that you're just a mom. You're just a laborer. You're just uneducated. You're just an older person. You're just a stupid kid. The devil's going to get you to try to not show up to your fight because you don't believe in who you are. But God has called you out by grace. So the story of Samson goes that Samson, he finds his girl. You know, and, 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 and he finds his girl. And of course, he's got, he got to find a Philistine girl, right? His mom and dad are like, why can't you find a girl in the tribe? You know, it's like, it's like the young people. When I was the young adults pastor, they'd be like, Pastor Luke, there ain't no girls in, in, in the church. Girls come up, Pastor Luke, there ain't no man in church. So what, you got to go to the club and the bar to find a man? I'm sorry. Read the story of Samson and where that got him. I'm just saying. All right, that's a different, that's a different message. Samson finds this Philistine girl, and, and, and his parents are like, man, why can't you find a girl in the tribe? And then, and then the Spirit of God speaks to them, and they realize that this is God's setup for deliverance. And so he, he marries this girl, and, and then he has to go away because he, he kind of he he kinda got himself into trouble because he, he just has, has a hard time with self-control. So he goes away, and he, when he comes back, they're like, oh, we didn't know you were coming back, so we gave your wife to your best man. Okay. You know, I mean, Samson's one of those guys you don't mess with. So Samson, with a little bit of animal cruelty, finds a bunch of foxes, ties their tails together, puts a torch in between the tail, sends them through the farm and through the village. He sets the whole village on fire. Guess what happens? A bunch of angry Philistines come looking for Samson. Says, what does Samson do? Samson takes John's stance, and he says, come on, let's go. So they kill his wife. They kill his best man. I mean, and, and so Samson, he's done, man. That's it. So then Samson beats all these guys. And now they're, they're in a rage. So Samson goes in hiding. He goes to the, to the tribe of Judah. He hides in this place. And 3,000 people of Judah, they come and they say, Samson, the Philistines are coming after you. They're going to kill us if, they don't, if we don't give it to you. And so Samson's like, don't kill me. Just tie me up. Give me to the Philistines. I surrender my life over to those guys. And so they tie Samson up. And they take Samson to the Philistines. And in Judges, the 15th chapter, we, we pick up right here in Judges, the 15th chapter. And it says that when he came, Samson came to Lehi. The Philistines came shouting against him. And they were like, we have Samson. Oh, and they're like rejoicing. We're like, we got Israel's judge. We got their savior. We got their strong man. We are the man. And they're all, they're all rejoicing. They're all celebrating. They're all happy. It's like the devil when he looks at you and you got beat up. And he's like, they're down. You know, I remember Carmen back in the day in Champion, and he's like counting. He's like one, right? And he's like, there's light coming from his eyes too. And then like, you know, like Jesus is starting to wake up and all of a sudden it's like, it's like whoa, you got to look. Go back on YouTube. I'm sure it's there. 90s. I'm a 90s kid. Give me a break. They came shouting against Samson, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. The Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. Look, at you might just be a mama. You might just be a laborer. You might just be a student. You might be in the sunset years of your life, but the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson. Guess what? The spirit of the Lord that came upon Samson is on the inside of you. So don't let the devil tell you you've got nothing to offer because the spirit of God that came upon Samson is living on the inside of you just waiting. Let me at him. Let me at him. Let me at him. I got this. And the spirit of the Lord came upon Samson 
mightily upon him in the second part of that. This is so cool, the second part. And the ropes on his arms became like flax burned with fire. Think of like an old, a old hemp or an old, old, old school rope that was burnt, charred, blackened, right? Came like flax burned with fire and his bonds broke loose. The, the, the Hebrew translation right there is melted. I mean, think about this. I, I love this. You know, it's like the spirit of the Lord came upon Samson and Samson just, just imagine this buff guy, right? And he's just like, they're shouting against Samson and he's just standing there and you can just feel the power of God coming upon him and it's just like, all of a sudden he just starts to flex. Like, you know, it's like Terry Crews, right? The old, the old Spice guy just gets those pecs going bump, 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 right? Just boom! And all of a sudden the ropes, whoosh, And all of a sudden the Philistines, their shouts of joy start to become shouts of terror. But he's still got handcuffs! And all of a sudden it's like, And you just see this image of Samson surrounded by this army of Philistines just kind of breathing in like, oh, ready, right? Just, flexing at it, going at it, just showing all these muscles. And the Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson just like the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you. And all of a sudden, something happened to Samson. It wasn't Samson's natural ability. Now it was the Spirit of the Lord upon Samson that brought him to a place of victory, just like your strength is not relying upon you. Your strength is relying upon Jesus on the inside of you. So the Spirit of the Lord comes upon Samson and, and he breaks these ropes. I mean, I, I, I think it's one of two ways. It either went like, Wah! right, like scary, or it was just like so subtle it was scary. You know, like when somebody's like so mad that they don't yell and it's even scarier than when they like blow up and he's just like, Whoa. opens his eyes real slow. Like, oh my gosh, you know. And then look what it says. Look what it says in verse number 15. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey. And he reached out and took it. Think about it for a moment. I'm just a mom. I got kids. I'm just a laborer. I got a broom or a lawnmower. I'm uneducated. I can barely read. I'm, I'm older. I, I'm, I'm retired. What can I do now? I'm young, and I, I'm, I'm, nobody wants to listen to me because I'm, I'm young and naive. Samson looked up, and he saw a jawbone. You notice how God didn't put a sword? God didn't put a club? God didn't put an AR-15, M4, extended magazine, short barrel for close combat, grenade launcher on the... On... <laughs> Samson looked up, and he saw a jawbone. He saw a jawbone. And he took out his hand and he picked it up. You see, what God has called you to do, God has equipped you to do it. But it's not going to look like what you think it should look like. Samson should have been like, bah, where's my nunchucks? I'm going to Chuck Norris this place right now, right? But he saw the jawbone of a donkey. Gideon had 300 men in jars of clay. David had a sling and a rock. Elijah had oil and flour. Jesus had fishermen and tax collectors. It'll never look like what you think it should look like. Why? Because God doesn't want you to rely on your strength, your ability, your talent, your, your words, your wit, your life. God says, Paul says, were we not all foolish when Dan was talking about Gideon? Are we not all foolish? But God has taken the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. He has taken the weak things to, to make base the things that are strong. Why? Because what does this have to do with humble faith? It has everything to do with humble faith. Why? Because what did we learn? Humility is. Humility is depending on God. 
And so we go to the schoolyard with the devil, trying to depend on ourselves, looking at what we have, thinking, I got kids, I don't got time. I got a broom, I don't got time. I can't speak. I'm not a gifted preacher. I'm not a theologian. So I show up and I try to do it in my own ability, and I get beat up, and God says, no, I've put something in your hand. It may not look like what you think it is, but you don't even understand the plan I got for your hand. And with that jawbone, with that jawbone, Samson killed a thousand men. Because humility, depending on God, is going to take you to a new place in your life. It's going to take you to a new place in your life. So, so when you understand, look at it, it's not your ability. It's not your strength. It's not your wit. It's not your words. Jesus told his disciples, behold, I send you out as sheep among wolves. He says, they're going to take you to the, 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 the synagogue. They're going to take you to the judges. They're going to take you to the courts. They're going to they're accuse you. They're going to talk about you. They're going to do all sorts of things to you. And what does Jesus say to his disciples? He says, hey, don't you worry about what to say. Don't you worry about your argument. He says, you just keep your mouth shut because the Holy Spirit that's on the inside of you at the right time, at the right moment, will give you exactly exactly what you need to say and my plan and my will. It's not about you. It's all about Jesus in you. So church, you got to trust in Christ in Jesus. Put your trust in him, humble faith, depending upon him and use what he has given you. It might look like the jawbone of a donkey and useless, but God says what you think is going to be useless, like to Moses who he gave a stick. God says you don't even understand the power of Christ that's going to come through this. Look, church, you may never have a six-pack physically, but you can have a six-pack spiritually. Because that's how God wants. You know, maybe you need to, maybe you need to take, men, maybe you need to take your wife's lipstick. You're like, what? <laughs> and right where you stand in the mirror every morning and look at yourself and hate on yourself, maybe you need to just draw a little six pack <laughs> in the mirror and just stand there and say, this is what the devil sees when he sees me. And even though I may not look like this on the outside, because of Jesus on the inside, this is what the devil sees when he sees me. Growing up, since I'm talking about childhood stuff, growing up, I, I grew up watching Popeye. Man, the, the cartoons they have nowadays, everybody's all trying to be friendly, and, and like Captain Hook is like, you know, like let's not make fun of Captain Hook too much because he'll cry. Like, dude, Popeye got the crud beat out of him by Brutus for 26 minutes out of that 28-minute cartoon. And then the last two minutes of that cartoon, y'all remember what I'm talking about? All of it would be like, Popeye, where's your spinach, right? And then Popeye would go, and he'd be all tied up, and he'd kick the can of spinach up, and the spinach would fall into his mouth. And like Samson, his bonds became like ropes, uh, flax burnt, and all of a sudden Popeye was like, boom, right? Church, instead of cracking open a can of spinach, we need to crack open the Word of God. Start getting what Jesus says about you because you know what James says? James says you humble yourself in the sight of God. Resist the devil and guess what's going to happen to him? Instead of you running from him, he's actually running from you. Because humility is strength. And in Ephesians, the sixth chapter, Paul tells us before he talks about the armor of God, Paul says these words, Paul says, be strong, not in your own. Be strong, not in your abilities. Don't be strong in your words. Don't be strong in your wit. Don't be strong in your gifts. So many times you say, man, if I could sing like, like Elijah, or I could sing like Jaden, or if I could play an instrument like, like Cameron, I would, I would just worship deeper. 
If I could, if I could find like these little nuggets of truth in the Bible, I would just go so much deeper with God if I could do that like Pastor Jim does. If I could serve with dedication like Lupe and Danny De La Hoya, then I would get involved. If I could go out like Mark Beltran with the outreach and not be afraid of what, then you know what? Then I would do something. If I could see a hurdles like Brian Schultz in the FDC and say, that's not going to stop me from feeding the Inland Empire, then I would do something. We say, if I could, God says, no, 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 no. Strengthen yourself in the power of his might not your might it's not your talent it's not your wit it's not your words it's not your mindset it's not it's not your physical ability it's Jesus Christ on the inside of you like the spirit of God that came upon Samson the spirit of God on the inside of you who's looked at you said look it around open your eyes and you'll see the jawbone of a donkey and he says what do you got to do with it pick it up And go to the fights. And the devil is going to run. John 4, 4, 1 John 4, 4. Jesus says, little children. John says, little children. Talking about the spirit of the Antichrist and the devil. He says, you are of God, little children. And have overcome them, the devil and his cohorts. Because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Hindsight. Hindsight. I love hindsight. Do you remember Mark 3? What John just said. Think about what John just said. Do you remember what Jesus said in Mark 3? Who will enter the house of a strong man like Satan and plunder his goods? unless he himself is stronger. Hindsight at the end of John's life, John says, church, church. The devil's trying to get you to sit down and shut up. But he who is in you is greater, stronger than he who is in the world. Like the psalmist says, death, where is your sting? Hades, where is your victory? Church, you are not called to sit down and get beat up. The church of the living God is called, like Samson, to break the strongholds over our city, over our family, over our jobs, and to get out there and to plunder hell's treasures and populate heaven with them. Because that is what God has called us to do. Let's give the Lord a praise in this house for your glory, for your purpose. Jesus. Told you preachers gonna to preach today. We just came on Thursday with our police chief in San Bernardino, gathered all the church leaders together, saying, look, there's tensions and it's palpable. And we're just afraid of the next time somebody makes a mistake, how bad it's going to be. And he says, we don't know what to do. We need your help. Church, it's time for us to stop looking to politics and police and policies. And it's time for us to stand up, take the fight, not look, not to the blacks, to the Mexicans, to the whites, to the cops, to the, to the politicians, to, to the illegals, to the homosexuals. That is not who we fight against. It's time to take the fight to the schoolyard. Call out the devil and his cohorts. You want to go? Greater is he who is in me than he who's in the world. Because that is who God has called his church to be. Humble faith depending on God. That's your calling. That's your purpose. Before we, before we finish, I'm just going to give a recommendation to all the men in the house. I read this book a couple of years ago. A friend of mine gave it to me. A mentor of mine gave it to me. Uh, and it's a book for men. Craig Rochelle wrote this, Pastor of Life Church. 
And in the first chapter, he says, girls, you don't need to be reading this book. It's a book for men, all right? And about halfway through, he says, girls, if you're still reading this book, this is a book for men. <clears throat> it's a book called Fight, and it's lessons from the life of Samson. You know, a friend of mine gave it to me, and I sat down on an airplane when I was flying, and I read it from, from cover to cover in one day. I couldn't put it down. I've given it out to a bunch of guys and our young adults, our, our boys and the young adults. We've gone through it in discipleship groups because it's time for us to stand up and be who we are called to be and stand up and take the fight to where the fight needs to be. So I just wanted to take that moment just to recommend this. I, I, told, our, I told our bookstore people that I would shoot this book out because it made a big difference in my life, and I don't get any kind of credit for this, but it's just a good book. So our bookstore, they, they have that down there, and they're going to give 10% off this weekend to, to this book just because I recommended it. So if you're a man or you've you got a son or a husband or a dad, somebody that you just know, man, they're dealing with some things in their life, give them that book and just say, you know what, check it out. Because all of a sudden, everything's going to change when we find who we are in Jesus Christ and we stand into who God has called us to be. I'll tell you what, when we, the church, takes our play, take our place, Everything is going to change in this world. Everything is going to change in this world. Did you guys get something out of the word of God today?